Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vago Maradian here in our brand new studio that we're using for the very first time in the Air Force Association's uh, Washington headquarters building. And our very first guest is former Deputy Defense Secretary Bob Work. Bob, we're honored to have you as our first guest in our new space. Thanks, Vago. It's great to be here. Um, it's, it's, great, it's great to have you on. Um, I wanted to uh, start off uh, by, by asking you about sort of the essence of strategy. You know, you've uh, had a, a long career in this business, but even when you were in uniform, you were known as a strategist. You know, and now is a time when everybody is talking about the need for strategy. Uh, the administration has uh, rolled out its national security strategy. The national defense strategy is coming out. Talk to us what the essence of strategy is, because there is a debate that's ongoing. You know, folks say you have to come up with a strategy first, divorced from resources. Is that the right approach to strategy? No, absolutely not. Every strategy comes with a dollar sign. Um, anyone who thinks that you can do a strategy or resource unconstrained strategy and then try to walk it back into some type of uh, resource plan is whistling past the graveyard. The art of strategy is prioritizing as, you know, every resource is scarce. That's the way you have to approach a strategy. And so you have to prioritize what do you want to accomplish? What are your ends? And then what are the ways and means in which you're going to get there? Uh, so to me, the best example of this in my career as a national defense professional was in 2012 when we received the first $487 billion hit as a result of the Budget Control Act of 2011. And it forced all of the senior leaders of the department to get together and say, what will be the strategy based on this resource level? Um, we never started with an unconstrained strategy and then tried to back it in. So uh, as far I am in the camp, that strategy always comes with a dollar sign. And what do you think our strategic priorities should be? I mean, during the uh, campaign, the president was uh, very firm about numbers, uh, larger fleet size, more soldiers, more uh, aircraft. But there is a fundamental fiscal constraint that's on us. So if you were doing, and I know this is a case that you've made before, but what do you think the priorities should be, especially if we don't get to that 3 to 5% increase that everybody is sort of counting on? It's a great wish list. Should the department get it? Likely. But when you're looking at a $21 trillion debt and rising and interest rates that are, that are rising, that becomes unachievable. What do you think the priorities need to be at a time when that budget increase may not be as prolonged as people want? I think historians and strategists are going to look back and see a very coherent post-Cold War period. It lasted from about 1989. Uh, and the reason why I choose 1989, because that was the year that the Department of Defense said, we are no longer going to build a defense program based upon containment. It's going to be based on something new. So from the Department of Defense's perspective, the Cold War was over in 1989. And I can even draw it to a specific speech given by President Bush in uh, 1989 in May 12th at Texas A&M, who said, we're no longer going to use containment. I remember that speech. Um, now, I marked the end of the post-Cold War period in early 2014. At that time, the Chinese had started a major reclamation area in the South China Sea. Russia illegally annexed Crimea and started to destabilize eastern Ukraine. Both of these activities are consistent with a great power trying to secure its near abroad. And so in that 25-year period, in my view, ended in 2012. And so the first requirement of the strategy is to contend with a reemergence of great power competition. And that is going to require us to raise our strategic game to a much greater degree than we've had to in the last 25 years. Because essentially in the post-Cold War period, the United States had a remarkable set of circumstances that favored its interests. And we got lazy strategically. We got very focused tactically. Uh, now when you're competing with not one but two great powers, you're really going to have to start to think about how are you going to use all of your levels of levers of national power uh, to make this long-term competition go in your favor. Do you, um, what are, what happens if DOD doesn't get that 3 to 5% by 2025? 20, First, do you think it's likely that it will? And if it doesn't, 
what has to happen? Do we rely more on nuclear weapons as a deterrent? Or are there bigger muscle movement, capability, capacity trade-offs that we have to make that will deliver us the capabilities and capacities that we need in ways that ever more sophisticated technological adversaries can't replicate? I just realized I didn't answer your previous question specifically. Um, Secretary Gates made the observation that you need three to five percent real growth per year to maintain the force structure that you have. And you say, why is that? Well, because operations and maintenance, O&M costs, taking care of your force was rising, those costs were rising faster than the rate of inflation. Personnel costs were rising faster than the rate of inflation. And Gates, after, you know, he's a pretty savvy guy, he said, you know, if I don't get three to five percent real growth, I'm going to have to start making cuts in my defense program. So if someone comes to me and says, hey, you're going to get 3 to 5 percent growth in your defense top line, the first thing I'm going to ask, is it real growth or is it just, you know, year to year and will it include inflation? And right now my understanding is the guidance is 3 percent or so, 3 to 4 percent, but that includes inflation. So maybe 2, 2.1 percent is already taken out uh, and you're already going faster than the rate of inflation in O&M and uh, personnel cost. So in my view, at this point, you have to bias, make a decision. You either bias towards capacity, numbers, 355 ships, 540K Army, uh, 36 Battalion Marine Corps, uh, 1,200 aircraft Air Force, or capability new capabilities that you, new cyber capabilities, new electronic warfare capabilities, new longer range weapons, new uh, tactical overmatch from zero to, you know, the last 2,500 meters. Three percent growth will not allow you to substantially grow the force and go after all of the capabilities that you're going to need. So the first thing I'm going to look for in the strategy is what does it bias towards? The other thing you have to ask yourself, are you going to bias towards presence? Or are you going to bias towards readiness? Because unfortunately, we have gotten into the habit when you don't have to deal with great powers and you have pretty much the run of the world, you can fritter away readiness by sending forces out to do shaping missions or uh, you know, partnership building capacity missions. All of them are righteous missions. They would be good to have. But you have to understand you're burning readiness. So you have, you're going to have to make a decision in the strategy, are you going to bias, you, because you're not going to say, I'm not going to do either, uh, but are you going to bias more towards readiness or more towards uh, presence? So those are the two kind of trade-offs when you're at looking at about a 3% growth that you have to account for inflation. And I just don't see that being enough to grow the force substantially. And in my view, the choice is pretty easy to make. We need a lot more capability than we have right now to redress what all of us in the department were worried about, which was an erosion of our conventional over. You were ringing the alarm bell with uh, Secretary Rumsfeld about the perishability of America's uh, precision strike. You know, almost every metric you used to spend a lot of time and your colleagues when you were at CSBA would spend a lot of time thinking about, you know, and Andy Marshall, uh, former director of the Office of Net Assessment, would look at how guided missile precision technology proliferation, uh, proliferation of drones and all of these things were going to limit America's uh, ability to project power at, at range and at will. Um, when you look at the things the United States should be doing, especially in the hindsight now that you're not in office anymore, what are the things the United States should be doing that is not easily replicable by any of our adversaries? Well, we're in a competition with great powers, um, especially one, China, that is going to be the most difficult competitor than the U.S. has ever faced, in my view. And it's important. I don't view Russia or China as adversaries. I can view them as geopolitical rivals. They are pursuing their national interests very aggressively. Neither of them like a world order in which the United States really kind of calls the shots, and they're trying to redress that balance. And so they're going to confront us, they're going to contest us, they're going to compete with us very, very, very aggressively. That doesn't necessarily mean they're, we're adversaries, although you can take a look at some of the things that Russia did, for example, in our election, 
uh, and some of the things it's doing in uh, Europe. And you say, well, that's pretty much adversarial uh, you know, relations. So it's important for us to, uh, it all gets back to, this is about great power competition. We have to have national strategy to address them. We have two competitors we really have to be worried about, and everything revolves around that. So it's going to be difficult to do something that our competitors can't replicate over time. But those of us who study revolutionary war theory, you know, it really is how fast can your competitors copy what you're doing. And what you want to do is get into a position of being a fast leader rather than a fast follower. Because as a fast follower, you're always starting uh, to kind of react to where the uh, lead competitor is going. So I believe that we can be a fast leader against these two competitors. But we're not going to be able to generate a decade or a decade or two advantage that we're going to be able to ride like we did the last 25 years. We're going to be constantly in a very, very dynamic competitive relationship, especially with China. What's the single most important thing to do to stay ahead of that power curve? Um, the most important thing without question is to really focus on AI, autonomy, machine learning, and make sure that you are a fast leader in that competition. Um, AI, autonomy, machine learning is changing our society right before our eyes. And whenever something like that happens, like in industrialization and mechanization, it changes the way you fight wars. So it is unquestionable that AI, machine learning, and autonomy is going to change the way we fight in the future. And we have to be the fast leader here. No matter what, though, we're going to be technologically surprised. This is a very, very much more level competition than in the Cold War. In what is now known as the second offset strategy, we said if we go after digital microprocessors and information technologies, there is no way that the Russians will be able to keep up with us, Soviets, excuse me, the Soviets will be able to keep up with us. We will generate an advantage that we will have for quite some time. We knew that. Well, we're not going to be able to do that. The Chinese just came out with a national strategy on artificial intelligence and autonomy. And let me just break it down for the audience. It basically says, this is the competition we want to win. By 2020, we will grow equal to the United States in these technologies. By 2025, we will surpass the United States. And by 2030, we will be the world leader. And it will allow us to grow our economy by at least 26%. And it would allow us to be a dominant military force equal to the United States. To me, that's a pretty serious challenge that we have to face. And that will affect everything else we do. It will affect ballistic missile defense. It will affect C4 ISR, command control, communications, computers, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. It affect undersea warfare. It affect long-range fires. It affect tactical dominance. It affect everything. So if you were going to ask me what is the one thing we better, better do well at, it's that. How do um, we... But with a nation that has such a concerted strategy, right? Our national security strategy is out. There's no mention of the importance of doing that. Uh, the Chinese system is an authoritarian one. So if that's the goal that Xi has set, uh, now that he's one of the three enshrined uh, leaders, um, there is no stopping him. And we've had concerns that their AI capabilities may be significantly better than we had thought that their capabilities, uh, where their capabilities are. How does the United States effectively compete in this leveled world with a nation that has put a premium on that capability? It's a great question. Um, to me, this truly is a Sputnik moment. Now, if I look back on the space race, when you boil it all down, it really was about national prestige. Who was going to get to the moon first? I mean, it was all about who was going to go into this new domain and who was going to get there first and who is going to be the first one to orbit and who is going to be the first one to have a space station who is going to be the first one to get to the moon um, ai and autonomy is a totally different thing it's not just prestige it's going to have a major impact on our economy it's going to have a major impact on the way we fight wars in the future so this is a much more important one to do so to answer your question i was disappointed that the national security strategy really didn't address this challenge. 
just like in 1956, 57, 58, when President Eisenhower was saying, how are we going to respond? First thing he said is, we're going to have a civil space program led by NASA, the National Aerospace Agency, and we're going to have a military program. We need to be thinking of the same thing. Should we have a national AI agency, which is making sure it's not going to be like the Chinese, which as you point out, authoritarian regime, very top-down driven, nationally kind of. But, but increasingly, right, it's starting to go bottom up as well, which is what the most dangerous part of their program is, but go on. And so should, what is our national response? And you are exactly right. The Chinese are catching up. And if they haven't already caught us, uh, they will certainly catch us by 2020. Uh, and so I'm confident that we can be the fast leader in this uh, in this competition with Googles and the Facebooks and the Amazons and all of the different uh, vibrant uh, commercial startups that we have in this in this area. I'm absolutely certain we can be the fast leader but if we don't get serious about it and we just think the market will take care of it then I believe the Chinese have a leg up on us and may be able to accomplish their goals. Do you think there is a danger with China? Uh, the United States as, as you mentioned I mean n nobody has seen anything like China. It has uh, the manpower, uh, it has the industrial capacity, uh, it increasingly has very potent organic technological capabilities that are uh, increasingly, you know, at odds and, and occasionally being unchained by that authoritarian government that can point it all in, in one direction. Um, and enormous economic reservoirs uh, that is, are being manifest, whether it's One Belt, One Road, or all of the global initiatives that are, that are going on. And there are those who say that with U.S. retreat, it gives China an opportunity, right? Who thought that, that, that she was the guy who was going to get up at, at the World Economic Forum and be like, well, I'm the free trader uh, in, in, in the room? At what point is there a danger that as the United States gets you know, saddled with more debt, you know, there has to be infrastructure spending. Everybody recognizes that. That goes beyond a border wall, for, for example, but it's sort of a national infrastructure plan. That's going to be a lot of money. Debt is still at $21 trillion and, and rising. At what point, the worst thing that could possibly happen is that China concludes that we're actually, our conventional deterrent is actually not a deterrent anymore. That it's a lot of empty promises, a lot of empty talk, a lot of wishful thinking, uh, a lot of bow waves. And um, at, at, are you concerned at all that at some point China miscalculates by looking at the United States saying, you know what? I'm not really concerned about their conventional deterrent, and I'm willing to take a few risks. How dangerous is that? And what does the United States have to do to ensure that China does not get the wrong idea? Because as a Japanese diplomat once told me, you know, the, the Japanese general staff was, uh, you know, every year the question was, can we take the Americans? Can we take the Americans? Can we take the Americans? And it was in early 1941 that the conclusion was, yeah, I think we can take the Americans. And then unfortunately, a war breaks out. Well. First, let me start by saying great powers generally try to avoid fighting other great powers if they can possibly do it, unless they are really looking to upset and kind of shift the order uh, of nation states as they exist. And that's been especially true since the creation of nuclear weapons. And to your point, we generally think that parity at the strategic level is a good thing. Our theory of deterrence is based on mutual assured destruction. So we have a START treaty with the Russians. You have 1,550 deliverable nuclear weapons. We have 1,550. We have a triad. There's absolutely no way that you can wipe out our triad without leaving us. I mean, we will always have an assured second strike capability and we'll be able to annihilate you. So parity at the strategic level, we're totally comfortable with. Parity at the conventional level, as you've said, is not that great of a thing when you're trying, as a, a status quo power, you're trying to keep things as they are. And if you think back into the mid-80s, once the Soviets achieved nuclear parity, everything turned to what is the conventional balance in Europe? And in the late 70s, we concluded that the Soviets had superiority, conventional superiority, and we better do something about it. So that led to the second offset, air land battle, the revolution in training, the all-volunteer force, uh, you know, the uh, uh, move to jointness. All of those things occurred because we wanted to gain a conventional overmatch because we felt that if we could convince our adversary at the time, the Soviet Union, that they would not be able to achieve their objectives if they went to a conventional war, uh, that was a good thing. 
And we know we did it. In 1984, uh, Marshal Ogarkov, who was the head of the Soviet general staff, said, you know what? The Americans have done what they said they were going to do. They can fire guided munitions with such accuracy and such density that they will achieve the same battlefield effects as tactical nuclear weapons. Our campaign plan will fail. So we know that when you have that type of thing, it helps deterrence. And so that's why the third offset was all about trying to gain some measure of conventional overmatch uh, to make sure that the miscalculations are to try to make sure that miscalculations wouldn't occur. What has been the impediment? You know, the, Obama, the Bush administration started talking about smart power and integrated power. The Obama administration talked a lot about smart power and integrated power. Uh, this administration, if, if you read, there are elements of that uh, that are very, uh, that are across the document. But at the end of the day, the whole complaint is, none of it is integrated, none of it is joined up. What is the impediment? What has to happen to get a national strategy that is aligned on military, diplomatic, economic, and cultural which is an enormous weapon the United States has. Well, look, our all-volunteer force and our nation was never really considered being at war for 16, 17 years. That has such a disproportionate effect on everything that you're doing. It takes all of your strategic focus. It gets you back down towards the tactical level. You know, what are the uh, tactical things we're doing in each of the theaters to make sure that we're achieving uh, where we're going. <clears throat> so the first thing we have to do, Vago, is we have to accomplish whatever we want to set out in the Middle East, the greater Middle East, with a far fewer number of forces and a far less strategic effort. And then we have to focus on the basic problem, which is great power competition. Now, in 1973, it was very interesting. The Office of Net Assessment was going to be on the National Security Council staff. But uh, Harold Brown, Jim Schlesinger convinced everyone to bring the Office of Net Assessment down to the office, I mean, to the office, uh, or the Department of Defense. Of reporting directly to the Defense Secretary. Yes. Well, I think you need to rethink that. You might not want to take the Office of Net Assessment and move it up, but you might want to recreate an Office of Net Assessment at the National Security Staff with long-term strategic professionals that are looking at the strategic competition with our two great powers and giving um, recommendations to the National Security Council on how we bring together all of these elements of national power. The Chinese, I would say, have a pretty clear grand strategy. It is economic cooperation, coercion, and co-option. Well, military power won't necessarily address that grand strategy. We're going to have to figure out how we can compete with that. Uh, the Russians, I think, have a grand strategy. Since they're not as strong as either America or China, uh, they, on destabilization, active measures, what they refer to, which is you know, what everybody calls operating in the gray zone. They're trying to destabilize their opponents, their rivals. Uh, they don't want to take them on militarily. They think they can accomplish their goals by destabilizing them trying to mess around in their elections, trying to embarrass leaders, trying to uh, gain uh, you know, the communist parties in, in some of these nations. And so neither of these two are, hey, we need to have this huge military to address. Uh, and so that's why I think we really have to figure out how we address these two competitors in a much more strategically coherent manner. Um, how would you grade your, the Obama administration's approach to strategy. Um, critics said it lacked strategy. Uh, supporters said it was actually very strategic. You may not have liked the strategy, but it was executed. From your standpoint, what was right about the Obama approach? What was wrong about the Obama approach? Well, I think President Obama, and I, you know, I obviously never spoke to him directly, but if, you, if I listen to what he was saying, what he was saying is, look, something is wrong. The United States has been at war more than it's been at peace since the end of Cold War. We're the greatest democracy in the world. You know, uh, there literally has been more months at war than more months at peace since 1989. The all-volunteer force wasn't made for marathons. It was made for sprints. 
It was made for short uh, kind of wars, either with a great power where you would stop before you reach the nuclear threshold or against regional powers that you would be able to uh, confront, defeat, and then reset. So I think the president's basic grand strategy was, look, we have to be smarter about the use of military force in the world. We have to look at other aspects of our national power. He was very high on using soft power. Uh, he felt that was very, very strong. And he wanted to do it in a way, and he was very, if, if you think about what he was, he would always refer to Eisenhower. You know, it was always about, which is one of your was one of your heroes. Absolutely, I, I you know if somebody asked me, I consider myself an Eisenhower small R Republican. There just aren't that many of them left, but uh, you know fiscal responsibility and being very very careful about the use of military force, being very circumspect about it, um, and so I think he had the right thing, and he said you're going to have to stop doing so much in the Middle East, and you're going to have to move to the Pacific where you're going to focus on China. The competition between the United States and China, he felt, was the most important thing. So I think on the broad scheme of things, he did have a st coherent, strategic uh, view of the world. I think where he viewed Russia as a, as a mid-level mid power that really didn't have a lot going for it in terms of its ec economy, its demographics, and I think that once Russia moved in and annexed Crimea and uh, started to destabilize Ukraine, we didn't make the adjustments in the strategy to account for even maybe, although it was maybe a declining great power, it still could cause us a lot of problems. Uh, so overall, though, I think the basic strategy that the, uh, President Obama had was a, a reasonable one. As you said, some people might not agree with it. Uh, but I thought it was strategically coherent. Um, and you never had a conversation with him? Is that unusual that a deputy defense secretary would not have had a conversation about that with the president? Well, I mean, one-on-one. -on -one. I would always be as a part of a National Security Council meeting where I would observe the president and hear what he had to say, and I could contribute if uh, I was uh, one of the principals in the meeting. Uh, I was uh, able to listen to him interact with his combatant commanders and the secretary of defense and the uh, deputy, uh, you know, uh, the vice chairman, the joint chiefs of staff. So I heard him speak a lot, and I think I understood what his strategic worldview was. Uh, but I never had a chance to sit down and said, hey, what were you thinking about this? Um, uh, and, and he didn't like that sort of broader collaborative setting always, right? I mean, everybody on this team has always said that. Yes, I mean, uh, it was, well, he just had a very, very, a remarkable gift for sitting and listening to everyone and then at the end of a meeting synthesizing what he had heard and saying here is what I'm thinking about it and uh, you might disagree with him like for example I disagreed with his uh, view on the nuclear triad and the need to uh, recapitalize and modernize the nuclear triad I disagreed very much with his view but it was always very coherent and lucidly stated and he did not mind if you push back and said, hey, you know, I just don't agree with that. This is, uh, this is the way I would look at it. So I thought he was extremely effective in those uh, venues. Well, why did you, why do you think, uh, it's interesting you say that, why do you think that the nuclear triad does not need modernization? Oh, if I meant, I, I hope I didn't say that. Uh, the, the, the pres President Obama, as you know, his context was a world without nuclear weapons. Okay, got it. And he, was very, very, very skeptical about spending the money to recapitalize the triad. And he was constantly pushing the Department of Defense. Why do we need a triad? Couldn't we do this for a lot less money? And the Department of Defense had a pretty un unitary view. Hey, the triad is very important. All of the service life margin is out of the triad. We have to replace it, and we need to get on with it. So if I gave the impression that I was against. <laughs> no, no, no. I was very much for it. That's 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 exactly what I thought. But in that, by the way, uh, and I don't want to get on a tangent, but I mean, there were a lot of conservative Republican friends of mine who 
would really side more often than not, you know, we're never going to use these things, we shouldn't be spending as much money on them. God, the B61 program, I mean, I, I would hear sort of chapter and verse on, on why the B61 was, was a really uh, bad idea. I want to go on to strategy in this administration. Um, what do you think about this administration's approach to strategy? And specifically, what do you make of the national security strategy and the debate about whether it's a Trumpian document or a non-Trumpian uh, document? Ultimately, the president is the decider, decider in chief. So anything that happens is decidedly Trumpian ultimately. But what's, what's your sense? What's your sense about strategy, strategy formulation, and the document? Well, I hate to use the term strategy with all these documents that come out. To me, they're more strategic policy. Um, strategic intent? Uh, st strategic intent, strategic policy, the framework, the context for the way that the administration is going to approach the world. It doesn't really say that the eaches of what you're actually going to do, which makes a strategy real. What are the specific ways and means you're going to you know, pursue to achieve your ends? It doesn't get there, but it was very good, I think, in describing the global situation. It was very strong in saying, uh, hey, uh, great power competition is back. We need to really, really pay attention to it. Um, overall, I think, uh, I thought on balance, it was a very good strategy, uh, a strat strategic policy that it kind of said, this is the way the world is. Now, it was a good document. It was a good document. And uh, the With HR and Nadia's fingerprints all over it. Uh, well, frankly. yeah, I mean, uh, there were a lot of people who were uh, doing this. And the key thing is, uh, I think the president admitted he didn't really read it. Um, so it's the staff. It was a large effort, an interagency effort, uh, that basically said, this is the way we think uh, we have to position ourselves in this new world. And uh, how strategy comes down is how are you going to execute it? So the question I will have is, is the president going to execute based upon the tenets that are outlined in this strategic framework, or if he's going to go in a different direction? It's hard to tell. But overall, I thought it was a pretty strong document. Well, what, do you, what do you expect from the national defense strategy that's going to be coming out next? And by the way, I, I shouldn't have given short sheet to, you know, Jim Mattis is in, the, you know, you can hear a lot of voices that were uh, in Washington, including the teams in the department and elsewhere on the National Security Council. So it wasn't fair for me to just sort of shout out those two. But, you know, being familiar with them, you know, you could hear certain things that, that both of them have said over time. But talk to us, you know, what is the expectation from the national defense strategy? I think it's going to follow from the national security strategy because there was a lot of back and forth between the White House and the Pentagon. Um, I think it will emphasize that the program, the defense program, the types of capabilities and forces that we buy will be biased towards uh, uh, high-end competitors like Russia and China. Uh, I would guess that it's going to be very consistent in saying whatever we do in the future, we've got to accomplish our goals in the Middle East, the greater Middle East, uh, at a lower strategic cost to the department. I think it will weigh in on whether it, uh, you focus towards capability and cap or capacity and weigh in whether you focus on readiness or presence. And I think, uh, remember, this is going to be a classified strategy. So what the only thing I'm worried on, Vago, is the unclassified strategy will come out and people will say, oh, this is just milk toast. This is no good. <laughs> You're going to have to wait because it will be leaked. You know, and then uh, people will uh, have a much fuller picture of what's going on. Uh, but I would expect it, and you heard uh, Deputy Shanahan, uh, my successor, talk about this. He says, I want this to have very clear priorities so that all of the defense programs and the program objective memoranda and the decisions we make in the department on building the joint force, we will have priorities set out for us so, and we will follow it to the letter. Uh, so. I'm expecting it to be a little bit more pointed than in the past. Do, what do you, um, is, one of the things that we understand though is that the document makes scant mention of something which uh, you and your team focused a lot on and Dr. Carter focused a lot on, which were swarming drone attacks. Uh, you know, we've seen the Russians face that, at, you know, at the hands of, uh, um, you know, ISIS in, in terms, and, and it, you know, it was homemade, but, you know, effective, something that's been worn for, for a long time. Um, is that a potential mistake? Should we be paying more attention to that problem? Well, I haven't 
I don't know where it would put out that as a specific thing, but I, I assume that it will say, here are the investment uh, portfolios that we need to really put our money in. And I would expect AI and autonomy and machine learning, which allows you to do these type of swarm attacks, to be a prominent part in there. I don't know how prominent, I don't know how much it will be. You know, a lot of people, and we were talking about this before, a lot of people say, hey, is the third offset dead? And I say, well, what was the third offset about? It was, you've got to compete against great powers. You do offsets when you have great power competition. When you are the dominant world power and you're dealing with uh, regional powers, you don't really have to worry too much about offsetting the regional powers unless they have nuclear weapons, in the case of uh, the DPRK, North Korea. Um, so that was the first tenet. The second tenet is our conventional overmatch is eroding against these two great powers. We want to make sure that our conventional overmatch at least gives us a, a pretty certain, uh, not certainty by any means, but at least some confidence that there won't be a miscalculation on the conventional side. All that is in, you can see it throughout the national security strategy, and I think this is going to be all part of the national defense strategy. And then what we said is, well, what is the primary technological competition you have to win? And that's AI, machine learning, tech, uh, and autonomy, which we talked about before. But the third offset was, okay, services, what are the operational concepts, like air land battle, air sea battle, uh, operational maneuver from the sea, things like that. What are the operational concepts and the organizational constructs? What type of new units do you need to make to give you a competitive advantage on the battlefield. The third offset wasn't about technology per se. You know, I constantly get this complaint, ah, oh, work, this was just a RMA that was, uh, you know, was... You flip the RMA on its head yes, and, you know... Well, it's an offset and, you know, you're still, uh, you're, you're still all technologic, you're a techno... A you're techno a policy guy uh, dabbling in technology. Uh, listen, I mean, uh, essentially, every time we dabbled in technology, we were guided by, like, the Defense Science Board and uh, talking with people like at Amazon and Facebook, and we were saying, what are the technological competitions we have to, we have to win? But the third offset was, what, how are we going to use that in a way to gain an advantage at the operational and tactical level of war? I gave a speech at the uh, Army War College, for example, and I went up and said, look, you need to tell me what Airland Battle 2.0 looks like in the world in which there are swarms, there's cyber and electronic warfare right on the forward line of troops, where the bad guy actually outranges you in guided munitions. That's a pretty nasty world. What does Airland Battle 2.0 look like? OSD isn't going to tell you. You've got to figure that out and tell OSD. Start to make the units that you need and the concepts that you need, and you're going to get all the support from OSD that you want. So the third offset, just like the second offset, you know, the techno, this would be like somebody saying, oh, well, we shouldn't have gone after digital microprocessors because that's just all technology stuff. Well, <laughs> without the digital microprocessor, you couldn't have guided munitions, you couldn't have had the battle networks that you had, you wouldn't have been able to have the tactical overmatch at 73 Easting. Uh, that everybody talks about and said, oh, we, you know. HR's battle. Yeah, absolutely. Well. You know, the big five was all part of that whole big offset thinking. And it's just that the guided munitions battle network revolution looked at the operational level of war, the campaign level. Right. And we expected the departments, the military departments, to be able to achieve tactical overmatch. And that's what they did with the big five in the Army. And that's what the Army is thinking about now. How did we achieve tactical overmatch? So are reports of the third offset's death exaggerated? I believe so. Uh, you hear the secretary say, my number one priority is have a ready uh, and lethal dominant joint force, dominant overmatch, lethal, more capabilities. What type of capabilities? Well, you're going to have uh, hypersonics, you're going to have more cyber, you're going to have uh, more longer range weapons, you're going to have autonomous weapons. and so. Uh, and then when you hear Deputy Shanahan talk about it, he talks about modernizing the force. Very big focus for him. And that is about getting more lethal capability. But the chairman talks about, look, we are losing our competitive advantage. That's the way he talks about it instead of saying overmatch. We're losing our competitive advantage over time and we need to change those trend lines. And 
So I believe that the third offset, regardless of what you call it, uh, is going to stay around. One of the reasons why I'm relatively certain that's the case is the governance structure that we set up to try to push these capabilities forward, the Advanced Capabilities and Deterrence Panel, remains. And it's still being run by the deputy and the vice chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff and the principal deputy uh, director of national intelligence, just like it was under uh, Secretary Carter and Secretary Hagel. You're a three-dimensional thinker, by the way, and that's because you're an artilleryman uh, at, at heart. No, I'm, I'm, I'm just kidding. No, I am an artilleryman. <laughs> I, I know you are. What I was just saying, that it's not, it, others can be three-dimensional thinkers as well, but it, it helps thinking in, in, in three dimensions. Um, second offset strategy was born in part because so much failed in the Vietnam War. We lost a lot of aviators trying to get a bridge. Uh, and so we decided uh, and Bill Perry was part of that team, and Harold Brown, and all of these guys looking at it and saying, look, how do we get more precise? And towards the end of the war, we were able to pretty much hit what we were aiming at. Uh, and, and so a lot of those lessons from that war from hell that was counterinsurgency combined with high-end war fighting sort of synthesized together. We were going against high-end Russian air defenses and losing guys, John McCain being an example, and so many others uh, that served as POWs. And so we vowed, you know, so those lessons from that war from hell really paid off, and by 1984 had Ogarkov and others going like, hey, you know, everything that we're doing is pretty much uh, off base. Um, what are some of the things from these wars and this very protracted wars that we have developed and operationalized? I mean, it's a permissive environment, so I think everybody appreciates it, but what are some of the other elements that we have invested considerable money that you think will give us a competitive advantage in this broader great power competition. Well, for those who think that the third offset is all about high-end warfare, there was a, we had a screenshot that I kept in my office. And it was a screenshot that was put on, the, uh, on a whiteboard uh, in the Special Operations Command. And it was written by a young special operator whose call sign was Yankee One. And uh, this operator was saying, look, I've got my team. I'm going after a high-value target. I've stacked my team up at a location where I think the high value target is. And for me to accomplish my mission with the uh, least amount of casualties, make sure uh, high probability success, I need the whole information dump right to me on the battlefield. And he had a whiteboard, and it was written on the whiteboard, it had space, it had a little picture of a space system, and it had a picture of a Reaper, you know, a, a UAS. It had a picture of ground uh, electronic warfare uh, systems and uh, SIGINT systems. Uh, and it was all being connected to Yankee One so that Yankee One would be able to, uh, you know, accomplish the mission. And that was the whole, you know, that was kind of the motivation. This global manhunting network that we have assembled over the last 16 years, high end counterterrorism, if you think about it, it had a unique sensor grid. It had a unique command control and communications grid. It had a unique effects grid. It was all tied together. The power of the network was provided to each of the individuals who needed that information. And it was kind of the thing that animated the whole third offset thinking. Autonomy, AI, et cetera, would allow you to have much higher degrees of human machine collaboration and human machine combat teaming. And that's all that the third offset was about. So anybody who comes to me and says, oh, work, this is just another RMA, I'm going to say, OK. So 10 years from now, you don't think there's going to be more robotics on the battlefield? And if he says, no, I don't think so, then I'll say, OK, you're an idiot. I don't really want to talk with you anymore. I, I hate to be dismissive, but holy moly, do you see what's happening in our society and what is happening in manufacturing and what is happening in these disruptive things like Uber and all of these different things that use the network in different ways. So the third offset is all about just saying, we want to move towards human machine collaboration and human machine combat teaming. We want to do it faster than our competitors and we want to be a fast leader in this. It's going to be constantly changing and it will help us in all of our operations. It'll help us in sensors, It'll help us in command and control. It'll help us in effects. It'll help us in sustainment and regeneration. All of this stuff will be fundamentally changed by this.
Uh, but so let's talk about the the weapon release part of it. There are those who warn about robotic warfare, uh, the concerns about autonomous systems with AI that are armed and free ranging a potential battlefield in the future. Uh, there are particular worries about warfare in space. Uh, you've talked and thought about both of them. In fact, one of your master's degrees, I think, is in uh, is, is in space, if if I if I recall correctly. Uh, you have three, right? Three, yeah. three. Well, well done. Um, we always knew you were a good student. Um, talk to us a little bit about the challenges there. Yeah, because there are those who say, look, it's important to have global guidelines that forswear this kind of conflict. On the other hand, generally when there has been conflict, one side or another goes into that space. And, and it's always the guy who's not thought about it that ends up being surprised by it. Talk to us about the challenges, the opportunities, and the potential dangers of autonomous warfare in either one of those spheres that folks are warning against going into, whether at a UN level or by international agreement. Autonomy is nothing more than delegating decision-making authority to an entity inside of your battle network. That entity can be a human, that entity can be a machine. So people say, oh my gosh, what happens if you delegate authority to a machine? Who are you going to hold responsible if the machine does something? You're going to hold responsible the commander who delegates authority to that machine. So that's all autonomy is, is delegating authority. Now we have automated weapons, which do something very, very good, like intercepting an aircraft. It has a lot of artificial intelligence in it. It can go up against electronic countermeasures. It can do all sorts of things. It can decide uh, what is the end game. But it's very, very narrow, and it's an automated weapon. We have lots of those. Then there are narrow AI autonomous weapons. Those autonomous weapons will be able to choose among courses of actions that it generates itself and executes what it's been told to do. I want you to go after and sink a ship. But if you find an aircraft carrier, I want you to attack that first. If you find a cruiser, I want you to attack that second. If you find a destroyer, I want you to attack that third. We'll tell the machine what type of decisions to make. We're going to tell the machine, look, Take a look at what type of radars you sense and what type of elant you sense. And then you decide, you literally decide your end game. That is going to be a narrow AI system. It's told, hey, you're going to go sink a ship. You're not going to decide to go sink, a, I mean, attack a tank. You're going to sink a ship, but you're going to be really smart on how you do it. And oh, by the way, you're going to start collaborating with other weapons, which is the whole idea of swarming, where six weapons are screaming in on a, on a uh, surface action group. One of the weapons goes high and activates its radar and says, I will kill myself. I will, you know, I will allow myself to be shot down uh, by a radar homing missile to give you the radar data so you don't have to turn on your radar. And then once they figure out, okay, they have this type of a radar, one of the missiles is going to say, I'm going to go up and dive. Another missile is going to say, I will come in low. Another missile will say, I will come in from the west. Another missile will say, I come in from the east. They'll collaborate. But again, it's a narrow AI mission. They're extraordinarily smart. What people are talking about and worried about are general AI autonomous weapons. And the difference between the two, a narrow AI, is narrow AI can choose, can make its own courses of action and choose among them. A general AI can make its own goals. You turn the weapon on, the weapon says, hey, today I'm going to go out and kill a tank. And I'm going to just do it because... It's, like, it's kind of a go-getter, isn't it? <laughs> so that is a long way away. As Craig Fields, who is the chairman of the Defense Science Board, he says, hey, right now, if I'm worrying about really smart AI weapons and really dumb, I know what I have to worry about. There's a lot of dumb AI out there, and i got to make sure that the AI is doing what I want it to do. We're a long way away from general AI autonomous weapons that set their own goals. That's what everyone is afraid of, the Terminator, Skynet. They decide what, for their own, what is their own goal. And there are a lot of people, I'm reading a book called The Sentient Machine right now, mm -hmm. um, which say, look, you know, there is a dystopian future, but right now, what, if, it's the collaboration of the human machine that is going to be so powerful. And there are ways in which we can make that so. So with AI and machine learning, what are the things that we need to stop investing in now? Because for example, if you, if you look at this, um, 
electric you know, autonomy is going to take drivers out of the game, you know, auto, uh, autonomous cars. Uh, electric cars will reduce the need for mechanics, uh, parking attendants. You, you may not even have to buy a car. You participate in a transport service at the end of the day. Each of the major automakers is, is looking at that model. From a war fighting perspective, what are the things that we are investing in now that we may no longer need to invest in with AI and machine learning? Well, I think I want to turn it on its head because the first thing that we're going to do, we have a term called algorithmic warfare. And so uh, algorithms tell the machine what to do um, and you can make algorithms that learn and that can teach themselves. And the way you do that is with lots of data. So the first thing you're going to uh, do is going to move to the cloud because you have to have a means by which to store triage and get the data. So everyone can pull the data as they need it to train their algorithms. Uh, you're going to have to have experts in coders and algorithmic warfare. That's what Project Maven is and perhaps in a future podcast we might be able to talk about that. So you've got to get the data right. You've got to have storage for the data. You've got to have expertise in algorithms to improve everything you do. Your logistics planning, uh, you know, your casualty evacuation planning, uh, your missiles, you know, how they attack targets. Uh, you're going to really focus on that. So we're going to go through this phase of machine learning and inserting algorithms into almost everything we have, which weren't built in the age of uh, AI and autonomy. And you will get step function increases just by that. Um, the things that you won't spend money on are things that you can't inject AI and machine learning into. If you have a machine that just can't learn, the secretary, Secretary Mattis talks about this all the time. We want to have a fast learning organization. Machine learning is the key to that. It will allow you to come across things you haven't come across before and to say, okay, here are ways we can go about this. We're doing it in cognitive electronic warfare. We're doing it in cognitive radar. You know, the machines are able to say, hey, this is a waveform I haven't seen before. What am I going to do? And they go through all sorts of different uh, uh, machinations to try to do it. So the only thing I can say now is invest in the cloud, invest in more algorithmic uh, warfare type capabilities, machine learning, getting the data coders, getting experts in, then inserting that in as to as many of your systems. And while you're doing that, have the services start practicing new operational concepts like air land battle and saying how will these allow us to accomplish what we want to do on the battlefield better nuclear posture review about to come out um, looks like it's going to endorse more smaller nuclear weapons question is on an already tight budget what are the implications you know when we had lots of tactical lots more tactical nuclear weapons out there training costs were higher support costs were higher because there is a carrying cost for having deployed nuclear weapons uh, that's the first part of the question uh, you know do we need tactical nuclear weapons and the costs that go with it if so what's the trade off and is it legitimate for the united states to consider a nuclear response to a cyber attack well um, i would expect I, I don't know this for certain, but I would expect that the Nuclear Posture Review says that we will recapitalize uh, the triad. We will have an air leg, a sea leg, and a land uh, leg in our triad. And I'm assuming that it will say at new start numbers. I don't know that for certain. As you said, I think there's been a lot of reporting in the press that are looking at reintroducing tactical uh, cru nuclear cruise missiles at sea in response uh, to some of the things that the Russians are doing uh, and also having smaller yield options. And the reason why I think that's happening is the United States and the Russia have an asymmetrical view of this. The United States views tactical nuclear weapons in terms of extended deterrence, that we will demonstrate our resolve to support our allies with tactical nukes and we are willing to go up the ladder if that's what you, uh, you know, the adversary is thinking about doing. The Russians think of tactical nukes in terms of escalation control, to escalate, to de-escalate. And we don't have a lot of small yield weapons that would allow us to respond to a 
demonstration by the Russians that is designed to stop us in our tracks and say and freeze the gears on everything. So it'll be interesting. I don't know what the logic is behind the, the uh, I haven't read the nuclear posture review, so I don't know what the logic is, but uh, right now the Russians have a lot of tactical nukes. Uh, I think the number that I remember was like 4,000, and we have a minuscule number of tactical nukes. And so this is trying to get at that asymmetry, I think. And on balance, I think that's a good idea. I just haven't been able to read the posture review and understand what the uh, logic is. Is it a good idea to have a nuclear response to a cyber attack? Um, it would depend. Uh, I believe it's very clear that the Russians and the Chinese view strategic cyber in terms of counter value targeting, targeting the infrastructure of a potential adversary, their electrical grid, their transportation grid, their food distribution grid. Um, and if you use cyber in that way, it is like using a nuclear weapon, but it's doing it more discreetly without the bad effects. Uh, you have to think, I think this is the way I'd answer it. I do not believe that we have a well-developed theory of deterrence based on all of the different things uh, that are potentially facing the nation. Long-range conventional attack, uh, strategic cyber attacks, precision biological attacks with genomic weapons. We have to think our whole theory of deterrence and how we, we respond. My colleagues at the Telemus group, uh, Jim Thomas, Bob Martinage, and uh, Mike Vickers, they think of it in terms of lattice deterrence. Whereas before we just had one ladder where you would go up the nuclear escalation ladder, but now you have an escalation ladder for strategic cyber, an escalation ladder for long range precision strikes against a homeland, an escalation ladder for precision biological attacks, and it forms like a lattice. And you may be taking something to de-escalate on one of the ladders, which actually causes an escalatory push on another. So it's much, much more complicated. So I think that's one of the reasons why I say we have to up our strategic game. Uh, we have to come up with the Herman Kahn's uh, to tell us in this new era of potential novel strategic attacks, what is our theory of deterrence and what is the proper response? Do, do, is that the best way to handle North Korea, for example? Is deterrence? Yes, I believe. Simple deterrence. Yes. They, look. Um, they're a declared nuclear power. We just we won't declare them a nuclear power because of the other policy implications. But they have nuclear weapons, uh, and I think containment and deterrence will work for them. Uh, and so that, I think, is where we'll end up. I have uh, two questions because you've got to go, and you've been very generous with your time. First, um, are the president's impolitic comments impeding the U.S. ability to execute its policy and undermining its relationship? with its allies. This is the way I would say it. A lot of people's uh, tweets now have become strategic policy drivers, whether we like it or not. So uh, in some cases, I think they help. In some cases, I think they hurt. Uh, but it is clear now that uh, tweets have to be considered part of the strategic calculus. And our competitors have to kind of discern what they're saying. When you're dealing with great powers, Uncertainty, in my view, is not a good thing. You want to try to make red lines, not red lines, but good rules of the road, where when a competitor crosses or doesn't follow the rules of the road, they know that there's going to be some type of proportional response. So the tweets make it very difficult for our potential competitors and even our allies to say, okay, what exactly would the United States do in a particular situation? Uh, so I think we just have to deal with them. This is the president is very clearly comfortable using uh, the tweets, and so it's up to the national security uh, apparatus to adjust to that. A difference between President Trump and Obama, you had a six-month uh, overlap. What were the differences between the two men and how they do their jobs? That is the subject of a much longer conversation. <laughs> we'll have to have you come back for that. Um, uh, very last question. Sean Brimley um, was uh, a friend to many, your colleague, uh, your friend, your confidant, uh, whether in the department or at the Center for a New American uh, Security. His passing at such a young age of 40 after a, a brief uh, battle with colon cancer really stunned everybody. Uh, and it was a beautiful uh, service for him over, over the weekend. 
what's what's his legacy as a as a defense thinker and more important doer? Yeah, for those who don't know Sean, he's just an unbelievable uh, person uh, who probably lived the live the life of a 90-year-old in 40 years. Um, you know, he was born in Canada, was a Canadian infantryman, uh, came to the United States, loved the United States, was a national security expert. He worked in the Department of Defense, wrote in large part the 2010 uh, National Defense Strategy or QDR strategy, Quadrennial Defense Review. Um, worked in the White House, uh, went over to the Center for a New American Security uh, and was their director of uh, uh, studies. Uh, I worked with him for a year when I was the CEO at CNAS. And the thing that's most striking about Sean, not only with just his love of the United States, he was, uh, became a naturalized U.S. citizen. He was so proud of that. Uh, and he, he was just naturally inquisitive, sharp as could be. But the thing is, he, he was just so personable. He, everybody around him, he would embrace and say, God, this is a guy I want to go out and have a beer with, and I want to hear what he's thinking. Uh, he was a great mentor. Uh, I worked with him on a report called 20YY, getting ready for the uh, age of robotic warfare. Um, wow. Uh, I'm just, I'm still shocked and reeling uh, from his passing. And uh, his loss is a real big loss for the national security community. I went to his, uh, his funeral last Saturday, and the church was literally yeah. packed. Um, just the number of people that he reached out and touched was unbelievable. I'm really going to miss him. He, is a, uh, he was a class person. He, he, did, he did accomplish uh, twice as much as people twice his age have, have accomplished, and he will be missed. And I just want to compel everybody, go to the, go to the uh, uh, website and, and donate three very young uh, children. Uh, donate money donate to, a, money. to his Three. Correct. Children. Uh, <laughs> to his children's <laughs> education fund, which is, which is very, very important. Bob, thank you very, very much. Really appreciate it. Always enjoy the conversation. And we've got to have you come back to address that larger question about the difference of uh, leadership style. I should have asked you earlier in the conversation uh, between President Trump and President Obama. I may be sick that day. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks very much, Bob. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me. It's been a lot of fun.